This is Joanne Culbertson Jeffries on June 16th, 2022 at approximately 1.15 p.m. Mountain Time. Lowell, thank you so much for agreeing to be recorded for the oral history collection of the Washakie Museum and Cultural Center in Worland, Wyoming. We have two goals in mind. First, that our class of 1960 tells what life was like for kids and teenagers in Worland from about 1941 to 1960. Our second goal is that we share how growing up in Worland impacted our adult lives. Would you please tell us your full name? Lowell Keith Peterson. Was there any other name or nickname that you were known by during your time in Worland? Yeah, Pete. Few you say it was Pete? Would, few people would call me Pete. Okay. Where are you now as you make this recording? Uh, at my home in Worland. If you weren't born in Worland, how old were you when your family arrived? And um, if so, did they ever leave? Uh, actually, uh, uh, I was born in Bismarck, North Dakota, and uh, moved uh, and lived in a little town called McCluskey, and uh, moved to Worland in, on June 3rd of 1954 when I was 12 years old. What brought your family to Worland, Lowell? My, my father worked for Mobile Oil Corporation and uh, we had an opportunity to move to Casper, Wyoming, Worland, Wyoming, or Ferndale, Washington. And my parents came out to Casper and Worland, like Worland, and the rest was history. Well, we're glad they liked Worland. That was good. Lowell, when your family came to Worland, did you live in town in the city limits or were you outside the city limits? Well, actually, uh, uh, my parents bought a new home at uh, um, 813 South 11th. And at the time, our, our home uh, faced west and across the street from our home, there was nothing but a field from there to Holly Sugar. Oh my goodness, so it was all just fields. All just field at that time, yes. Now, as you close your eyes, what else do you remember about the sounds and the smells right there in your neighborhood or in Worland itself, maybe the surrounding area? Well, other than uh, after a few years and houses got built across the street, um, believe it or not, in that from, uh, I think from Charles Avenue to Washakie Avenue on South 11th, there were 76 kids below the age of 12. How fun. <laughs> and uh, those were the days where uh, we had, uh, at that time, Consumers uh, Grocery Store, which became a &R Supermarket. And uh, um, this was before the Catholic Church was built in the area. And uh, it was just a neighborhood that, with lots of kids. Well, I, that sounds like it was a wonderful place to be. And I might mention, you know, downtown Worland at that time, had lots of stores, a lot, lot of small stores. I think uh, uh, Vaughn Ragsdale and J.C. Penney were, and Gambles were the only, uh, you know, chain type stores that I can remember. And uh, we only had two banks and the Kirby Theater and Mers Bakery. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to name a whole bunch of stores, but there was there were a lot of them there. It was well, fun to shop because you could you could find lots of places to go in and out of. Well, looking back at all those places, and you said you moved here in '54. 
you did not attend elementary school or um, when you were here, but coming in June 54, uh, what do you remember about those school years of the junior high? Do you remember going to the junior high here in Moreland? Yeah, and of course, moving here when I did, there wasn't school. So the only uh, kids that I met were ones that I met uh, uh, in church and I belonged to church group from uh, Zion Lutheran Church. And uh, um, probably, I'm guessing, I think David Sherman was probably the first kid that I met. Uh, and then I got involved in Boy Scouts. Uh, I had started in North Dakota and got involved in Boy Scouts that summer. And uh, in August of 1955, um, I made the uh, Eagle Scout. And uh, I remember uh, being awarded my Scout badge by the then governor of Wyoming, uh, Millward Simpson. Back in those days, that was a big deal. Yes. And uh, it's something I'll never forget. Well, and did you? I, I had earned my badge earlier than that, but I wasn't old enough to get it. So I had to oh. wait until August when they had a court of honor and I was awarded my Eagle Scout badge. That's quite an accomplishment, Lowell. Um, did you fill your time after school with other things than scouting? Uh, yeah, I worked. <laughs> Actually, uh, there used to be a, I think it was, it was a tasty freeze type thing by the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. And uh, my older sister, and if you remember John Stroud, oh, was very a much. science teacher. Well, I think he started that and uh, the family had that. And uh, anyway, my older sister worked there part-time and there was a few times that she would get real busy and I would go and help her. So that was probably my first job. And uh, went from there to, um, I know this isn't talking about jobs here or whatever, but anyway, then I, I uh, you know, I, I was only 12, years old and I think I helped out there the next summer also. And then I worked for uh, at a and R Consumers Supermarket became a and R Supermarket, which was Andy and Roman Perlinski. And I worked uh, there then in high school until I got fired. And then I went to work for JC Penney's. Uh, and uh, the rest of high school. So you were very active at school as well as working. Um, speaking of high school, what do you remember most about high school? Is there anything, anything outstanding? Were you involved in the activities there? Oh, let's see. I played uh, in the band, bass clarinet. And uh, actually, the band days were more fun in the, in junior high. We had baseball broadband and uh, we used to travel the state and, and march in parades. And um, the high school band wasn't quite as involved as the junior high band was. And uh, and I, I, I don't, I think my junior and senior year, I don't think I was in band, but uh, was in key club and uh, on a uh, student council. Um, because I worked, I wasn't involved in a whole heck of a lot of things, but have a lot of, a lot of good memories, made a lot of good friends. Yes, and with those memories, um, most of us in our class of 1960 are currently turning around 80 because of the COVID pandemic. Um, we've had to postpone our reunion. Finally, we're getting together in person. Are you ready? Were you ready for the reunion when it happened? Yeah, I think I was. It was actually uh, all, all our reunions, if you think back, I think uh, if you didn't have a good time at any of them, it was your own fault. 
because we just had a special class. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. Okay. Say, um, Moreland was one of the eighth largest cities in Wyoming when we grew up. Its population more than doubled because of the oil boom. Do you remember all that growing up? I know you said the folks had built a house and that um, out there where it was a new home. Uh, well, yeah, actually in 1958, uh, I don't know, my dad always wanted to live in the country. And in 1958, uh, I helped my dad, we built a log house on what is now Airport Road and my middle daughter and her husband live there now. Uh, but uh, um, that was a lot of fun building a log house and uh, it's still standing. Well, um, you've talked about all your work experiences and what you had done growing up. What do you remember about your time um, when you were in banking, Lowell, or how did you ever get there? Well, uh, actually, uh, after we graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And uh, I was contemplating um, um, going to Casper College and uh, didn't really know for sure what I would major in, but was looking at that and then also uh, you know, the Vietnam War was getting, was going about that time. And so I didn't, I was looking into maybe uh, going into the service. And, uh, but uh, I got a call one day from Joyce Taylor's mom, uh, Daisy, and uh, wanting to know if I might be interested in going to work at the bank. And, uh, I visited with my parents about it and I decided uh, that uh, if they offered me $200 a month, I'd take it. And so I went in and talked to uh, Ray Four uh, at the bank and uh, they hired me. And uh, then I guess the rest is history. Um, of course, uh, the banking business can be kind of interesting and, and really it was um, for some of us. Uh, I went through some a few hairy experiences. I, I was with the Stockwars uh, Bank for uh, 26 years. And uh, during that time, I had a few interesting things happened. I, uh, when I was a teller, I had a Another teller was stealing out of my uh, cash drawer and uh, had some interviews by the FBI and, and uh, got through all of that. And the person that did it, uh, that uh, finally confessed. And that's another story. Uh, then on November 1st, 1976, um, we had an armed robber walk in about 11 o'clock in the morning and started shooting things up and and uh, uh we survived that um, wow that's, that's a day i'll never forget uh, and then uh several years later uh, had a customer sue me for 10 million dollars and uh, they uh, the court threw that out but uh, anyway, so I had a few interesting experiences. And then after 26 years, my wife and I decided to start a hardware store. And we did that for 30 years. I was going to ask you about when you transitioned from banking into your store. Tell us about your hardware store, Lowell. Well, we, uh, uh, not knowing what, what we wanted to do after I, after I left, uh, the bank i didn't know for sure what we were going to do so we my parents lived in arizona in the winter time and so we thought we'd take a trip and we went down there and and uh, spent a little time with them and was still trying to figure out what i might want to do 
and uh, uh, had a friend that uh, said something because we would kind of talked about the hardware business because uh, uh, Warren and Betty Robinson were very good friends of my parents and they owned the coast to coast store here at the time or prior to that. And uh, anyway, we, uh, uh, this guy suggested that uh, he had a, a friend of a friend that knew this guy with the True Value Company. And uh, so uh, they had the guy call me and uh, he lived in uh, Joliet, Montana. He came down and we visited and we wondered, well, where are we going to put this store and things like that? Well, it so happened that Howard Culp was just in the process of selling out his business and retiring. So his building would become empty, which belonged to the Earl Maurer Farms Company. And uh, so we found out that that was going to be available. And so one thing led to another. And all of a sudden, we were in the hardware business. What year was that, Lowell? Uh, that was in 1987. 87. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it was kind of rough years. We didn't get rich, in, uh, but we sure did meet lots of neat people. I remember yeah. your store. You had a wonderful selection of everything. Well, it's a little different today than it was back in those days, I'll tell you. But uh, in a lot of ways, we miss it. Like I said, we miss the people. And the rest, the, is, the rest is history. Say, what other businesses do you remember what made an impression on you or the townspeople as you were a businessman? Oh, there was, uh, there was a guy by the name of Stan Standard that owned the Ben Franklin store. Mm -hmm. And that was a very popular store at the time. And, and of course, who can forget Johnny Murs? At the Murray's bakery. bakery, yeah, and uh, I don't know, we just, uh, 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 and back in those days, a uh, Wally Heine uh, had the, was in charge of J.C. Penney's, and, and then there was a Bill Hart, who had some kids about our age, a little bit younger, and uh, uh, we had a Western store at the time. Um, trying to think, just I don't know. All all the buildings on Main Street were full. I don't know if any of you guys remember, like the Slurp and Burp. Oh and, yes, and, in uh, Wilson's. Wilson's Drive-In, Max Drive-In. A W. Yeah, the A and W, and you remember Max Drive-In out north. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people don't remember it, but. Um, Anyway, they, they came and went. And of course, during all my baking days and when I was at the store, um, I sp spent some time. Um, I was on, on the uh, mem member of the city council when, when Worland got its artesian water. And uh, that's kind of a story of itself, but that, that was... Uh, I think one of the better things that ever happened to Worland because that's we didn't have to depend on the river for our water. And where uh, is the artesian well located, Lo? Uh, it's it's um, east of Manderson, between Manderson and Hyattville. And um, uh, there was a Husky Oil Company out of Cody had um, uh, permits for three wells in a location out there. And the first well they drew became this artesian water. And uh, anyway, they uh, didn't know what to do with that well. And uh, I don't know exactly how it is, but anyway, they offered it to us, but we had to put a, val put a valve on it. And the valve was $9,000 and I remember and the city council, we were trying to figure out where are we going to get $9,000 to put on that well? Because I guess uh, I'm assuming that some, something, if you shut down an artesian well, it may not generate again. So we had to keep the well flowing. So anyway, we spent the $9,000 and 
and put a valve on it. And I remember driving up there one day where the well was, and here's a garden hose coming out of it, draining into a stock tank that overflow into a draw down to the Nowood River. And uh, so it ran like that until we were able to take advantage of the well and put in a, put in a, a pipeline. Well, anyway, that was the most controversial thing that we had to do. We really wanted the water, but getting it, it's 23 miles from Whirlum to the well. And it takes a lot of pipe to go 23 miles. Well, anyway, then we somehow, I don't remember exactly how we raised the money, but, um, and then getting the type of pipe was a real job. And we had a local realtor by the name of John Moline that took a real interest in it. And he did a lot of research on pipe and stuff for us. And the most economical pipe for us to use was asbestos concrete pipe. Now the word asbestos is a killer. Yes. Well, anyway, asbestos is just a binder to hold the concrete together. And uh, I remember John had, he had sent, uh, talked to a lot of labs around the country and getting analysis on, elect on uh, asbestos concrete pipe. And um, they finally, we were able to convince the people in town that it was safe. I guess, you know, for example, I guess uh, if a mouse drank 10 million gallons of water going through asbestos pipe, they might find a trace of asbestos. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's that it was that safe. So anyway, we got the job done, and and uh, so now we have water. Actually, I think it provides most of the water for the Bighorn Basin. And that uh, that is amazing that one well has run that long and is still providing water for that many people. Right, well, and I, I don't, I'm, I can't remember because I haven't been on the city council for many years, but um, the two other wells, I don't think were ever dr drilled. I think this is, maybe they have, I'm not sure, but uh, provides water from Lucerne to Grable. And uh, that's a lot of water. And we have 2 million gallon storage tanks, one out east of town and one out west of town. So, uh, uh, and we have, it, even though it's, you know, it has a lot of minerals, it's good water. And we don't have to depend on the sugar factory to give us warm, tasty water when we have freezing in the wintertime. Well, and in the past years before the artesian well, the water did come out of the river and with all the mud and stuff we have and all the, it took so many chemicals. I think that many Moreland health problems were created by that unknowingly over the years. And now I, it'd be interesting study to see if some of those health problems have subsided that were so common 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. So well, what you least, did is phenomenal. And we do have a dependable supply, that's for sure, yeah. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I was just looking, I was on the city council from May of 1974 uh, till January 1st of 81. And- uh, Airport board, fire board. Oh, and then, uh, yeah, I was 13 years on the airport board. And I spent 13 years on the board of the Worland Fire Protection District. And uh, so uh, a lot of those were fun. And well, uh, I learned thank a you, lot. Lowell, for being there and taking care of our town. It's because of those of you that stayed in Worland and kept Worland going that Worland is still on the map. Is there okay. anything else that you could like to mention? Well, I married a girl from Jebel, Wyoming. <laughs> and we met in the alley behind the bank. Oh, my goodness sakes. <laughs> well, had she just left the bank or was she just passing through? <laughs> no, she, she worked uh, on the business uh, across the alley. She worked for, for uh, uh, Duke and Jeannie Dover. Uh, 
Whirling Laundry and Dry Cleaners. Oh, uh-huh. And uh, yeah, that was about 60 years ago. Yeah, tell her our girls always think that's funny that mom and dad met in the alley. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that yeah. is a story that they should hang on to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, let me see. I'm trying to, I've kind of jumped around here. I don't know. Does that, does that screw things up? Absolutely not. I think you've done a wonderful job. Um, we did jump around a little bit, but is there anything that, any memories of your, the students that you're, the kids you went to high school with that, you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, there is a few. Uh, I don't remember what year it was. I think it was might have been 1957 because I think that was the year. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember Benny Strauch. Uh, but anyway, yes. he had gotten a new car. And uh, you know how we used to drag Maine looking for something to do or some trouble to get into? Well, I remember one evening and I think it was I think it was Dennis Bauer and Bill Day and myself were riding around with Benny in his new car and at the time Benny lived on a farm out of tie down ranch mm -hmm. south uh, west of Worland of town well anyway when he had come into town that night he noticed he'd seen some deer in the, in the hay field on the way in and Anyway, we're dragging Maine and stuff, and, and um, if any of you knew Benny, he was kind of a uh, a free spirit. And uh, anyway, th there was a, a, a family that uh, um, Benny knew was having kind of a rough time, and uh, Benny said, you know, I know so-and-so, and he said, they they could sure use some meat. He said, I saw this deer coming in. He said, let's go deer hunting. Now this is about 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> and uh, so we go out there and oh, we got a 22 rifle. And, uh, and I think Benny was the one that took the shot. I'm not sure, but anyway, shot this deer and then we couldn't find it. Well, anyway, we finally traipsed through the fields there and we found it laying in a ditch and it was deader than a doornail. And he had hit it, shot it between the eyes. Oh my. <laughs> with headlights from the car. Well, anyway, we took the deer into the, these people. They lived out at McNutville at the time and uh, took the deer out there and strung it up and skinned it and gutted it out uh, about midnight for these people. I mean, and here we're illegal as can be, you know, but I f it felt so good to do that. Oh, yes, it would. It would feel good and to help a family feed their children yeah. and take care of themselves. You know, if we'd have been caught, we'd have been in trouble, but uh, it sure felt good. Well, I think that was the mentality of a lot of the ranchers and farmers and the people up in the no wood and stuff. They fed those animals year round with their hay fields and the salts and the water yeah. just because they were available. And if the meat was used for camp meat or for family, it wasn't wanton waste. And that's a marvelous story. Yeah. I was gonna ask you, Lowell, when you were in business, do you remember the Christmas tree that Worland used to have? Was that still up at that time? Every at the end Christmas? of Main Street? No. Yes. No. Uh -uh. That's where we used to go around the tree when you're dragging Maine. Uh huh. Yeah. No, it was it was gone by that time. Oh, was it? Yeah. Do you remember when it ended? Uh, actually, when they built the new bridge across the river, and then. That's that did away with the uh, with the tree, and I'm not sure what year that was. It seems like one year they had it there at Tenth and Main, across from the courthouse, but most of the time it was clear up on that um, east end or the west end, right before they right. Uh -huh. put the road in. Well, and, and do you remember when they used to have the neon stars all over the street on Main Street? Yes. I remember growing up on South 11th, 
our next door neighbor was a man by the name of Walter Schultz, worked for Wyoming Electric Sign Company, and he made all those stars. He was a, oh. a neon uh, tube bender and stuff. Anyway, Walt made all those stars uh, when he was working with, for Wyoming Electric Sign Company. Uh, and then I remember he and his wife moved to Grable and bought the Coast to Coast store in Grable. And, uh, uh, but, but he was a very, very talented guy. And, oh, he uh, must have been. But yeah, the only thing bad about the neon stars, they screwed up with the signal from KOMA. Oh, Do you remember and what that? was KOMA, Lowell? The radio station in Oklahoma City. Oh, how well I remember. Yeah. What did you call in and request? Uh, we never did. We just listened to the radio all the time. They always had good music. And then there I was one in Del Rio, Texas. I don't remember what that one was. I don't remember that one, but the KOMA, yes. Yeah. That was a good one to listen to. Yeah, you always drag main and listen to KOMA, except you couldn't do it while the neon lights were, stars were above Main Street because that interfered with the signal. <laughs> Things you remember. I had forgot about that until just now. Oh, and then the, the uh, evidently not too many people remembered the, uh, She's one of the boys things, the the operetta what we did mm -hmm. in, in junior high. Uh -huh. I was just flabbergasted that Robbie D could remember those songs. That that was amazing. And she remembered every word. Yeah, man. That, yeah. And uh, yeah, I can I was Briggs the butler. The only <laughs> time I ever sang a solo in my life. What did you sing? I'm a butler, name of Briggs. I've served in every strata or something like that. I, that's about all I remember of it. I think all of us were blessed to have grown up in a small town with teachers that were vested, not only in the schools, but also in their community and the people in it. And Wyoming still has many towns like that today, but they're fewer and fewer because of the growth yeah. and the, so many changes. Well, it, you know, uh, you were mentioning about some teachers. Uh, when I was a senior, I, I took two years of mechanical drawing. And when I was a senior, I was the only student. So Joe Killen was my teacher and I was his student. I love that man. Yes. Yeah, he, he made an impact on many of us and we were, um, I think very fortunate to have the quality teachers that we did and many many of our teachers were also coaches yeah and many of those coaches did go on to the university to coach and it was a loss to Worland. yeah but it was a boon to the university well i think didn't clarence daniels he was an assistant i think at navy yes i believe so yeah yeah and yeah. um, do you remember the professional ball teams that Worland used to have? Oh, yeah. Billy Martin and Satchel Page. And uh, um, what was the guy from Tensleep that played on the Worland team? Jack Stein uh, played for the Worland Indians. Yeah. Well, all these things before television. I mean, it's just it's amazing. You know, Mike and I were talking about the Coconuts Dancing Club the other day. Yes, you remember, my you parents know? were involved. Yeah, I mean, uh, and then television came along and, you know, and of course, I we didn't have a, any TV in North Dakota. So the first time I ever saw TV was, well, actually, the very first time I ever saw TV was in the old Emerson Hotel in Minneapolis, Minnesota. When, oh, I was ten, when I was 10 years old, I had a, uh, I, I sold the Minneapolis Star and Tribune Sunday paper, and I had won a free trip to the Minnesota State Fair. Um, I'm 10 years old. So I go to Bismarck by myself. My foot dropped me off at the train, and I go to Minneapolis to the fair. 
well, here's all these 10 and 12 year old kids in this hotel and the TV was just coming out and a hotel had dedicated one room on each floor with a TV in it. So you can go there to watch the test pattern, you know. <laughs> and that was in about 1952. Well, then when we moved here in 1954, we had, uh, I remember getting our first black and white TV and, and uh, we'd watch, uh, what was there, our Miss Brooks, um, the test pattern, and it was go off at 10 o'clock every night. And then you remember KWRB TV in Thermopolis? Yes. Yeah. And uh, Mildred had, Ernst. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Mildred and, and uh, Ernst, Joe. Joe Ernst. And uh, they had a guy by the name of Hannibal Hanna that, that uh, lived up on Boysen Peak and kept their uh, antenna going. Yeah, and now you can't even get good TV. <laughs> no, yeah, you mentioned the coconuts. Can you explain what the coconuts were? Well, it was a, I, I don't even know how we got invited, but it was kind of an invitation only uh, group of individuals that would get together about, I'm gonna say twice a year uh, and, and dance. And we always went to the old community hall and we'd have a band. And uh, back in those days, Carol Whalen was used all the time. He was the guy from Cowley, had a great band. And uh, anyway, uh, and then once a year, we'd have a, they'd have a dinner dance. And, and uh, I don't know how many, maybe there were, 30 couples, something like that, I'd guess. But uh, it was it was before television and, and uh, it was good, fun and entertainment. It, and most of the coconuts, as I recall, were ballroom dancing, right? Right, yeah. And yeah. they had a formal, they yeah. had a formal dress and attire with the orchestra. And it was really something to watch. Yeah, and it, it really, yeah, I mean, it wasn't real expensive, and it was a good time, and, and uh, just, uh, and, mo and it wasn't just young couples, there were a lot of older couples there, too, you know, so it was a, it was a real uh, Duke's mis mixture of the population. Let's see, let's see, you, you said something about teachers, I, I think back to some of the interesting things with teachers and like I told Mary, Mary Lise, uh Sandy you know I'll never forget uh, Irene White you know you know she'd have you write a term paper and it asked how you know how long does it need to be and her favorite expression was just like a lady's skirt long enough to cover the subject and short enough to keep it interesting <laughs> And I she was quite a lady. See, can't you just see Mrs. White saying that? Yes. What a lady. Yeah. Yes, she I, was. I remember <laughs> Velma Pickard uh, hitting Dean Fredericks over the head one time with a ruler. Mm -hmm. She hit him so hard she didn't even mess it up his hair. <laughs> <laughs> she was so fragile. You remember her? <laughs> mm -hmm. In yes. fact, talking about that, we're uh, they're having a uh, I think uh, the 23rd, I think it is, a memorial service for artists. Uh, you know, she died last year, last July, and uh, they're having a memorial service here, I think, on the 23rd. Oh. And artist Meisner was her name. She was Artist Picker. Yes, Artist for Bunny, uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now, yeah. Bunny was Esther's daughter, and Velma was her aunt, I believe. Right, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Esther and uh, and Velma were married to the brothers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's see. What else? Do things. Well, I I think that you've covered many many wonderful topics, Lowell, and given us a good insight as to your years in Worland. If there isn't, if you thought of anything else that you'd like to well, mention. Worland's been good to us, you know, and uh, uh, I, I have to enjoy, my, 
I, I really did enjoy my uh, years of public service because it was always appreciated and, and uh, it was uh, uh, the years with, on the city council were probably the most trying because um, uh, actually, I don't know, it, were we growing during those years? I'm trying to remember. Hmm. Yeah, you know. Anytime you are a public servant and at the will of the people, it would be very trying because you can't please everybody. And you do the very best you can with the knowledge you have. Yeah, from 74 to 80. Yeah, so what was I about uh, six, six and a half, years. seven years on the city council. And then when I didn't run the Dennis Bauer took my place for the next term when he was on the city council. So he kept yeah. it in the class. Well, and then of course, you know, then I don't know, it was several years after that, you know, Sonny Shear was our mayor. And let's see. So um, the class of 60 has been well represented. Well, tell us a little bit about the wall of history that you've been involved with, or the wall of honor there at the high school, where we've had several of our members inducted. Oh, uh, well, actually, uh, I don't know how, a few years ago, I'm trying to think six or seven years ago, uh, several of us were trying to figure out, you know, all the schools in Worland are like east side, west side, don't have fancy names or anything, you know. And uh, we got this beautiful new mi middle school, junior high. And uh, there were several of us, for some reason, got to think, we, why couldn't we name that building Roger Utes Middle School? And there were several of us. There was well, John Davis and Jim Gilman and Dave Bostrom and me. And I don't know, there was about six or eight of us. And we had many, many meetings and talked about how, how to promote that, you know. Well, anyway, we got to the point where we were going to present it to the school board about changing the name of, of the middle, instead of Warlock Middle School. And uh, anyway, we got shot out of the, the principal at the middle school. He didn't know who Roger Utes was, didn't mean a thing to him. And, and uh, uh, he was, so he went to bat against us, I think. I don't know, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say that. But anyway, uh, he wasn't in favor of it, and I think kind of convinced the, the school board to leave it Orland Middle School. Well, I think to appease us, they came up with this wall of honor. And I, I, that's, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the way I feel. I think that's what happened. And, uh, and it's a good thing. It really is a good thing. And I think Grant, uh, Grant was in the first class. What is the Wall of Honor, Lowell? Well, it's um, um, anybody that, uh, I don't know if they had to graduate. Originally, I think it kind of started out as being for athletics, you know, and uh, uh, anybody that's made a name for themselves or, um, or brought, put Whir Whirland got, was in the spotlight because of them type of thing if you graduated from Moreland or went to the Moreland and uh, well it's just like the University of Wyoming has one and Ray Sanchez is on the University of Wyoming yes Hall of Honor and uh, I don't know if we, they can get him here or not because I don't know if Ray went to school here uh, but he sure did a lot in fact they're having a special here uh, the, the old Moreland Monarchs are going to have a deal at the museum in his honor. But uh, anyway, uh, this last year, uh, getting Rick Hake in, involved in there was kind of difficult because it was hard to know what Rick really did. 
but Grant's convinced that Rick Hake was the smartest person ever graduated from Orland High School. And I have to agree with him. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Rick and I, or Grant and I sponsored Rick last year, and uh, he's, uh, he was inducted last year. And, and uh, they had six people last year. There's only four this year. And I just got a call yesterday. Um, Grant and I had sponsored John Davis, and he was selected. And oh, John wonderful. Called, John called me yesterday to let, let me know well, that uh, he was selected. And Well, here again, Lowell, even though you're not on city council or a banker anymore or a business owner, you're still involved with keeping Worland on the map and keeping it alive. And as behalf of the class, we just appreciate that so much because without you, we'd have nothing to come back to. <laughs> and um, one last item here, is there anything else that you've thought of that you'd like to say before we close? Hmm. Well, I don't know that. I'm, I know I'm forgetting lots of things. Uh, there's some things that I better not say. Uh, you know, not 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 that there's anything wrong, but with them other than the fact that uh, things that I didn't understand as a kid that I do today. Let me put it that way. And I think that's true with all of us. Well, for generations to come that may listen to the stories that you've presented to us. Is there any wisdom that you would like to pass on that, to them right now? What would you want them to know? Well, yeah, I don't know why this popped in my mind. I can remember the parking lot at, at the high school. There wasn't a pickup in the parking lot that didn't have a gun rack with a gun in it. That's try right. That, try that today. That's true. Yeah. And we were very safe, even with all of our guns. Yeah. Well, Lowell, thank you so, so very much from all of us for sharing your experiences um, for the public while you're growing up in Worland. It's truly appreciated. We Thank you. Well, you know, uh, I should mention, you know, my mother uh, worked for Earl Bauer. Uh, when she was alive and, uh, you know, Earl was trying to get Worland a, a junior college mm -hmm. back, I think it was in like 1948. <coughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but I was, was the understanding that he was going to, he would have donated the land where Blowdorn Lumber is out east mm -hmm. of town for a junior yep. college and the town wouldn't go for it for a couple of two or three reasons i think they would have had to form a uh, a district which would have meant a mill levy uh, to get it started i guess right. or keep it going and um the the riffraff they didn't want this riffraff of those college kids coming, you know, tearing up our town. And, uh, uh, you know, it just, you look back and, and, that from, and that's around the time Powell got Northwest from what I understand. But, you know, I, I can't imagine kids in 1948 being wild. You know, they weren't even as wild as we were. No, <laughs> they were in their own way, but not, you know, they didn't have, yeah. Uh, it wasn't public knowledge without right. all the social media and the Facebook. Yeah, but you know, it really would have been it really would have been nice to to have a uh, to have a college here or a yes, trade school or something. You know, uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, uh, back uh, several years ago, I got my pilot's license and had an airplane and did a little flying around the valley here. And that's one thing that I do miss, but I'm sure I couldn't pass the physical anymore. But uh, uh, that, that was one of the things that uh, 
I had an opportunity to do. And, and uh, in fact, I didn't, uh, I don't remember when I was on the airport board and I, I talked to the gal that's a manager out there. And uh, I guess the guys whose place she took had destroyed all the old records of the airport board because they don't have an airport board anymore. It's all run by the city council. And uh, anyway, uh, but so she didn't have any records of, of when I was on the airport board. And uh, as near as I can tell, I'm not just sure when it was. But anyway, the other day I went out there and uh, there's a plaque on the terminal building. You know, we have a really nice terminal building that's sitting empty out there. Yes. And there's a plaque on the terminal building that has my name on it. So, oh. <laughs> so if well, I, kudos. So if I'm not, if I, if my name doesn't show up anywhere in town, and you're looking for me, I'm at the airport. <laughs> we'll know where to find you, Lowell. Yeah. Well. Uh, once again, we appreciate everything that you've done and your wife, Punky, you've added to the um, well-being and the welfare of Worland, and you've kept our class going, and we truly appreciate that and given us the opportunity to keep in touch with everybody. And so, again, I thank you, Lowell, and I know that everybody will appreciate listening to the stories that you've had because you have so much knowledge of Worland. Well, Thank I could you. probably rattle on too much, but. I think that you've done a nice job of covering your time when you first got here until today. Well, and you know, if, if you have one question about keeping in touch with friends from those days. You know, uh, Punky and I haven't done much traveling uh, the last uh, 30 years, but when we did do quite a bit of traveling, we always planned it to where we'd stop in and see somebody that we hadn't uh, from our high school days, you know, maybe oh, have yes. lunch with them or something. And, and uh, it's, it's just nice to have friends. Yes, it is. Well, you know, look at how the, to the town seems to be growing towards 10 sleep. You know, it's, uh, um, I think of uh, the businesses that, that have gone up out there. Um, I think of what's happened with uh, Pepsi in Worland. You know, it just has grown and grown and grown. And uh, thank goodness we have them. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you what, you cannot believe I did. I took my wife to the library yesterday and Kathy, you should see Kay Ray's paintings. It, that has really decorated that library up. It is beautiful. And, and uh, in fact, uh, Punky was visiting with Kay this afternoon and she's got a lot more paintings. She could put more up there. She's quite an artist, but what an uh, asset to the community. I'll tell you, it's, it's just really, uh, something to be super proud of that's for sure and, uh, now you were talking about growing out east of world and lowell in the days motel what were you well i was just i was just thinking about day, about days court and then there was the pawnee there was a pawnee motel out there um there was uh the there was a log cabin one across from the baptist church uh and um, a, a log cabin court or something like that. I can't remember just exactly what it was, but we had several little Ma and Pa uh, motels. But, uh, you know, the, as the way the town has grown or not grown, I can tell you the day that Worlin stopped growing was the day the Hotel Washington closed. Yes. That's, it's just, it's too bad somebody just didn't have a, a whole pile of something to keep that, you know? I mean, here we have the old Kirby Theater still standing there, but we don't have the Hotel Washington, you know? No, it's, no. Uh, it's really kind of a shame, but, you know, I mean, uh, Worland is progressing again 
and uh, I think uh, I think we're going to see some things happening coming up uh, as we as we get more and more manufacturing of small things. I don't know why these freight companies like FedEx and UPS and stuff, when they can't land other places, they land here. Well, you can always land in Worland, but you can't always land in Cody. Believe me, I've done it. And uh, so, I, I, you know, it well, seems it sounds like, like it would be a good place for a hub. Yeah, it is. And, and it seems, it seems, I think we're progressing a little bit now. I, um, I, I, if it wasn't for what's going on in Washington, D.C., I think we're going to have a good chance of some pretty good growth. So anyway, well, I guess hopefully things will turn around again. Yeah. I do believe that the class of 1960 from Moreland High School was very special. And we are very lucky to have over 80 of us still on this earth. And we hope that everybody has a another good year and you stay healthy, stay safe, and keep your face to the sun. Thank you, Lowell, for your all your information. Well, thanks, Joni. Yeah. If there's anything more I can do, just holler at me. We will do that. So if you need more information, I'll probably think of something else. Okay. <laughs> okay, Joni. We'll Thank do it you very much. <laughs> yes.